guess there's a lot that I don't know. Not really. Dad left, married your mom, and had you. Lost all his money in a pyramid scheme and put a pistol in his mouth. And now, you're here. It's good to meet you, brother. Hello and welcome to the Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast. I'm your host, Matthew Perkovich, and this is episode number 199. Out in select theaters across the US on March 29 and available on demand April 10 is Long Lost, a psychological thriller that tells the story of Seth, a young man invited to spend a long weekend with his estranged millionaire half-brother Richard. However, it doesn't take long for this family reunion to turn into a power play of seduction and taboo that will test Seth's limits. Talking to me now is the film's writer and director, Eric Bloomquist. And Eric, I just want to say congratulations with the movie and thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you very much, man. Happy to be here. So, I'm really curious. You come from you come from a background, um, short films. You've done a very um, popular uh, TV program called Cobblestone Corridor, which was an award-winning show. This is your first feature film. Um, why make the decision now to plunge into the feature film, and why did you think this story would be the best one to introduce yourself to the feature film world? Uh, I've been working with a lot of the, the crew and actors that are in my network for quite some time, and so it's just been a natural progression from short to episodic and now this feature. Uh, when we were thinking about the idea for this this movie, Cobblestone Corridor had just premiered on TV and one of the actors, uh, Adam Wepler, and I were watching the episode and started talking about different kinds of ideas for something that was very, like, not Cobblestone that also appealed to us. Uh, and we started talking about these character-driven, intimate chamber thrillers, mystery puzzle films with small cast, something that is within our means. Uh, and we just started talking about ideas and, and themes that we were attracted to in that world and movies like uh, Ex Machina or things like that, that that appealed to us. And then we started talking with my, my brother and producing partner, Carson, and we all started to sculpt the idea of Long Lost. And then we had a location come on our radar that we had a very narrow window in which we could shoot that was just far too good to to pass up and actually really inspired a lot of story beats and we were able to tailor fit the ideas and themes and characters that we had around our available resources and be inspired by those available resources and shoot the movie at that property you mentioned before that a lot of the, your crew and cast you have worked with before. You mentioned Adam played Seth, Nicholas Tucci uh, plays Richard, you got Catherine Corcoran who plays Abby. Um, I've noticed lately when talking to a lot of independent filmmakers that they seem to have a stable of crew, a stable of actors that they work more and more with. Um, I want to just uh, ask you in regards to your relationship with your crew and your cast that you've worked with repeatedly. Does this come down to a thing where you are comfortable, um, you love the working out relationship you have with these people, and does it make it easier as an independent filmmaker where you have uh, restrictions in regards to uh, time and resources to get the same people together and work on a project that way? I think it's absolutely paramount in terms of being able to get a project done uh, successfully to have a team of people with whom you share an innate sense of trust, history, and camaraderie. I mean, we certainly bring new people into the fold, but we have a really, really strong core network that I think allows us to tell the stories we tell uh, in in a quick way where we don't feel like we're cutting corners. I mean, my, my director of photography and I, Thompson Wynn, have been working for the last five years together, and the two of us have like a mental shorthand now where we can just look at each other and know what the scene needs or know what direction we want to go in and just kind of nod. And that's the direction we, we want to go in. And in, ter in terms of acting, I'd worked with both Adam and, and Nicholas Tucci before and, and knew their sensibilities. They actually both did the short film for the cobblestone corridor. They'd never met cause they were uh, on different shoot days, but they knew of each other's work and the movie was kind of crafted with their sensibilities in mind. And they're both just really strong, really dedicated uh, effortless actors and who, who, who are highly creative. Um, both were producers on the project as well. And bringing those voices into this project, I, I think it's it's what allowed us to to get it done at the level we got it done and to shoot it as quickly as we did. We did the whole movie in in ten days actually, and I think that's that's because of the teamwork. And it's not just the keys. I mean, a 
lot of my uh, a lot of my crew, uh, gaffers and costume designers and key grips and and production assistants. People are people are coming back because I, I think we all feel an ownership stake in the stories that we're telling, and I'm, I'm very grateful for for everybody. Long Lost is very much a story about seduction and different methods of seduction. One of them. One of the person who's being seduced in this in this um, story is a character of Seth. Now, what I find really interesting about him in, in your movie is that other filmmakers might go down the exploitative route and route and have their character, the main, main character, be tempted and, and tip his toe in temptations and and create kind of like scenes and scenarios which would be exploitative in, in, in its kind of uh, in, in in how it presents itself, but. The interesting thing about Seth is that he is a character with a very strong moral core. He, he resists a lot of the things that is thrown at him. How important was it to have a character like that that has really strong, kind of like, on the outside it doesn't seem very strong, especially in comparison with his half-brother. From the inside, he has a very strong kind of stable core to him that uh, personifies how he is in every way. I appreciate you saying that. I think that was... Uh, it, it was very important as we were sculpting the character that we wanted him to be somebody who uh, was was the everyman, the every person who from whose perspective we were we were watching the movie. At least the first time when we watched the movie, we were watching it with his perspective. So we wanted it to be someone who always operated in the plane of logic and was aware. I mean, for, for those who haven't seen the movie, uh, there are a lot of very weird behavioral quirks that happen from uh, Richard and Abby, who are the, the two people in the house when Seth arrives. And we wanted him to constantly be teetering on this line between being able to uh, be very uncomfortable, but also to be able to find a way to write it off. So we wanted him to always operate in the plane of logic, but see how far, uh, what, 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 what would make that, what would make that tip into something else. But at the same time, we also wanted him to have his, his his weird eccentricities too. I mean, they're very overt, uh, and particularly Richard. But we wanted Seth to uh, show his kind of foibles and, st- and strange character quirks in their in their own way. Because at the end of the day, I think every character in this movie is is lost in their own way. So that you know, the title has multiple multiple meanings. So I think that his character is somebody who's who's fresh out of school and has been invited to a new life. And something that Adam brought to the table that wasn't even as uh, explicitly in the script is that he walks into the house with this sense of, of hope, of this sense of optimism. And, you know, in my mind, and he, Adam plays this as well, things have not been going for him well. I mean, it's, it's, he's two years out of college. His, he doesn't really have a family. He doesn't really have direction. But Adam still walked in with this sense of, of optimism and hope for family, for connectivity. And I think that is what allows us to go on this journey because uh, we understand why he's there and why he's staying even when things get really weird. And the thing about um, about his character as well is that he's very much an idealist, and I think that's something that's picked on uh, by his brother uh, Richard. Richard's a very interesting character in the way that Nicholas kind of portrays, and I'm sure it's very much uh, a purposefully done on your part that he comes across as kind of like this kind of mix of American psycho, Wall Street, Wolf of Wall Street kind of persona. Is that something that you really want to, to have his oh, character come across <laughs> as? He would love that you said that. Yeah, absolutely. That was that was very uh, very important to us from the from the very beginning. That he was this. Oh God, I think the initial character description was 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 something like uh, uh, enigmatic businessman meets gregarious frat boy, uh, yeah. and that he can flip on a dime, and that his his switches are so polarizing i mean at one point he's kind of you know manic depressive introspective and the next he's he's bullying seth into into doing something uh embarrassing or or demoralizing and i wanted the audience and i want the audience as you know for for the many who haven't seen it to to be leaning in and wondering wondering why that is and trying to see what makes this person tick so i mean it was tucci was just so so creative in all of that. And I think that it, it, it was great that he had a chance to ride this, this bizarre uh, kind of absurdist, funny line at, at some points. And he, he really elevated everything that was on the page and brought so many of his own creative ideas and um, a healthy level of improvisation to each scene, most of which made their way into the movie. And I think kept the, the scene buoyant, every scene that he was in buoyant because there was always this sense of play. The person who melds them all together is a character of Abby. Um, 
in I, I kind of this this film has kind of like like different tools of seduction which is thrown at Seth, and she's definitely kind of one of them. Um, interesting thing about her character, and I think it's something that a lot of people don't talk about in regards to just say the femme fatale type is that while they are characters of seduction and they use their bodies in, in ways to to tempt people, they're very in, intelligent characters as well, and Abby definitely comes across as that as well. I'm curious as to what do you think Seth really? It seems to me that. Seth, what Seth really is drawn to in regards to Abby is at first, yes, how she looks and how she, how she conducts herself. But not only that, but also her intelligence. She's, uh, she's very successful and such. I think he was really drawn to that more than the other things. Would you say so as well? I, I think that, that that is the case. I mean, and just like with how, how Richard can switch in a dime, I th- Abby's character description was something like uh, she, she has the, the enigmatic ability to seamlessly transition from matriarch to good-humored friend to, to lover, sometimes only over the course of a sentence. And I think that that is, is so, in a strange way, intoxicating to somebody who, who has never been there before. Um, and, it, and it's like showing different sides of a, I don't know, acting teacher say, you know, you, you show different sides of a diamond when you hold it up to a light in different ways, different parts of it are shining. And that was very important. And it goes back to your your earlier point about not being exploitative. I mean, we certainly want it to be a throwback to these kind of pulpy erotic thrillers of the nineties. Cause those are just, those are, you know, basic instinct. Those are just fun movies, yep. but we wanted it to also mix with contemporary puzzle film too. And to, and to have full fledged characters and to see different layers based on, you know, which part of the diamond you're, you're shining a light on, because I think that makes it really fun. And I think it harkens back to our tagline. Life is how you see it. And, and, what are you seeing? I think the fundamental, one of the fundamental themes of this movie is, you know, who who are we? Does do we change based on only on who's in the room? There are only three characters in the movie, but there are seven different dynamics. There's the three of them together. There's each pairing: uh, Abby and Seth, Seth and Richard, and Richard and Abby. And there's each of them individually, and we see them. Uh, each of those characters, we see those seven dynamics over the course of the movie, and they're different in every one of them. And that is the central theme that Adam Carson and I wanted to explore as we were writing the story. Another tool of seduction in this movie is the house. And I, I've talked to um, directors before about using settings as characters in the house. It very much feels like a character, a thing that lives and breathes. It's almost like a, a kind of playground where this kind of game is being been been um, played out. Um, you mentioned before you had a very limited time period to get the house. Uh, so a two part question: number one, where did you find this place? And number two, something that I just wanted to jump on that you spoke of before: in what ways did the house, did the setting change what you had on the paper on paper in your script? Uh, we shot the house in uh, the, the house. I should say it was located in, in Greenwich, Connecticut. Uh, I'm really glad you picked up on the character thing because we, from the beginning, wanted the house to be uh, its own character as as the movie progressed and got increasingly strange. We wanted the house to be this this omnipresent uh, force, sort of like the the Hotel in the Shining or or the Oscar Isaac Estate in Ex Machina. That there is this there is this. Uh, just just omnipresent force in the in 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 the character's psyche, whether they're they're aware of it or not. Uh, and so, an early reference was the was the Shining in that sense, in that you never really have a full sense of the geography of the place. And this this house certainly let us do that, where we were able to shoot in I don't know, probably like eighty percent, ninety percent of the property. But you never really know where you are. It feels infinite and claustrophobic at the same time, especially in the probably the back nine of the movie. So knowing what the resources that we had at the house informed, I think, some specific character beats uh, and also informed the kind of cool camera tricks Thompson and I were able to do as we as we shot the movie. Another thing about this film I found really interesting, and I think this could just be a part of cultural ignorance on my part than anything else, is the different type of games that these characters play throughout the film. Um, one of them that really took my imagination was Chubby um, Chubby Bunny. Chubby um, Bunny. So <laughs> explain this. Uh, I just want to explain this real quickly to my listeners, and you correct me if you can, because this is the first time I've seen it. So pretty much the, the, the aim of the game is you have a bowl of marshmallows. You've got two players that have to shove as many marshmallows in their, in their mouth and say the word, Chubby Bunny, the first person to uh, not do so loses the game. Um, so, is this a game that you made up? Is this a real kind of thing? E- educate this Australian about the ways of these American um, games that you guys play in this film. <laughs> you know, 
I've never personally played it, but there was a kid's show. I forget what it was when I was watching a game show, and they played this. They only had to shove four marshmallows in their mouth. Um, but I remembered it was in the back of my mind somewhere. And when we were thinking of different interesting children's games, because that's a, that's a thing that happens over the course of the movie. Richard challenges Seth to different children's games. This, this popped into my head because there was this – it just lent itself so well to this weird – Hyper masculine uh, face off that this that that this scene turns into, uh, and so I, I it, it just it just really really resonated in that way. So no, I, I haven't played it. And about half of the people, I don't think it's just a cultural thing. Half the people who see the movie uh, say, "I'd never heard of that game before. Is that a real game?" And half the people are like, "Oh my god, I can't believe you did that." I remember chubby bunny so it's really cool that you know even if it's your first time with chubby bunny that it's you know I, i'll say it's an experience no matter what <laughs> I, I must say as a fan of marshmallows it's a terrible waste of a fine sweet dog i'm just going to say that right now but um, um you should have oh, if you if you see the out points there the, the spit bucket grows every take it's very oh, uh it's, yeah. <laughs> i'd imagine afterwards that marshmallows would not be on the list of halloween candy coming up later in the year uh, you know, you'd have to ask them that, but I know that I'm always down for a good s'more. <laughs> um, I was talking to you um, off here before about uh, a TED Talk that you did. I saw it on um, on YouTube. Um, I think you did it. Was it St. Andrew's College? Is that correct? Yeah, St. Andrew's School in Boca Raton, Florida. I went down there last year um, and gave a, gave a talk while I was a uh, visiting artist there for a week. And pretty much the premise of the uh, talk was pretty much in regards to structures, structured improvisation. And uh, from what I can gather from, from watching it, it's about learning to go with the flow, but at the same time doing so with a very kind of solid grounding underneath you. Um, and I find that really kind of interesting because I think yourself as a content creator, as a filmmaker, you need that kind of structure underneath you but you need to have the ability also to just roll with the punches because bad things like you said in your talk bad things are going to happen and it's all about how you react to it and move forward which i find very interesting i think it's something a lot of people um can can really relate to what i'm really curious about is that when it comes to a film like long lost and especially with a story um, the way the script is so pivotal to kind of engross in the view of viewer in and taking him through twists and turns and such that combined with having a uh, limited uh, uh, resources, limited time period, does doing the structured improvisation thing does does it work as well as as I say to other projects? Considering that perhaps maybe improvising in regards to dialogue or story uh, might uh, might not be the best idea to move forward in, in regards to needing a, a script that's tightly wound and a film that also follows suit. You know, I, I'll say. Having the ability to actively recalibrate uh, with a positive attitude is, I think, the only way we were able to make movies like this and other projects like it. Because, like I say in the talk, bad things will happen. Uh, that's that's the that's like one intrinsic truth of the universe, and I don't say that in a, in a cynical way. I think it's just a, a fact of nature. But we have the ability to take them, to turn your garbage into gold, as it were. I think I say that in the talk, too. And, and, to, and to take and accept what you're given as you're given circumstances and to get creative with them. And to, when you have 10 days to shoot this movie, I mean, you, we're, we're all in the trenches together. And to know that we all have a, a stake in being creative and that we can, we, we can, we can come in as prepared as, 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 as possible and things are still going to happen, I, I think having that mindset... Is, is what allows us to do our thing because if we were if we were stuck if we refused to budge if we were uh, if we were paralyzed with certain things we we wouldn't have moved and the movie wouldn't have gotten done so that's that's how I try to live my life and certainly in art is f- fighting for certain things when you can when you can fight for them but knowing that it's okay to shift and to take what you're given and, and turn it into something that's, that's at least a lateral move from where you want it to be. It's very good advice. Now I think it's very good advice for a lot of indie filmmakers out there as well. Um, speaking about yourself being an independent filmmaker and content creator, I want to talk to you about, and it's something I've talked to other people about as well, is that, um, going with the flow in regards to the changing landscape of dig- uh, getting your films out there via distribution. Um, so mm-hmm. your, your film is both going to be in cinema and it's going to be on demand um, shortly after that. 
just looking at your stuff, looking at your Project Greenlight video that you did as well. The cinema is a place that's very important to you. Movies are very important to you. Um, but these days, to get people to really see your film, um, streaming is a big way to go as well. Where do you stand in regards to how you get your films out there? When you make your film, do you try to make your films thinking that people are going to see this in the cinemas, that people are going to see this in streaming? Does that even matter to you, or does that have an effect on how you can approach your things, uh, approach your approach your stories as a content creator and as a filmmaker? Uh, it, it definitely does matter to me, but I know that the the way of the world is that you, streaming is and will continue to be a, a huge thing. And of course, I stream all the time, and I watch a lot of movies, and it's a very valid, you know, can, can be a great way to to consume content. And at the same token, I, I am very much a proponent of the idea of cinema is sanctuary, that you can go to a place that does focus your mind in a way and put you in a state of being where you are able to fully immerse yourself in something. And even if you know, you're know you not fully immersed mind, body, and spirit, it's still a social thing where you are around other people and you are engaging content in a very direct, intimate way. And it becomes a, a conversation starter and something where you can chat with people and your experience with the film doesn't end when the final credits roll, where you're walking out and you're hearing chatter. And, and I think that in some ways only a movie theater can focus your mind and, and, and heart like that. So I will always be a proponent for, for the cinematic experience because I really do. And I, I know uh, my brother Carson and I talk about this a lot. It, it really, you know, there, there, there's nothing like it. You can't replicate that. At the same time, we, we did say from the beginning, I mean, this is like, like we, we want a long lost to be, and pretty much any movie we make, something that, you know, you're at a sleepover with friends in high school and you're like, oh, shit, I forgot about that movie. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get long lost. Put it up. Put it up. Put it up. Stream it. That's the kind of movie we want to make, too, where people are like, oh, yeah, let's watch that one tonight. Let's pull that one up. Because that, to me, is also, you know, um, a really cool social experience. So I want to make movies that... Uh, can function really well in in both of those worlds because I I respect and advocate for both of them. And uh, for everyone out there, you'll be able to see Long Lost both in the cinemas uh, in the US. It's going to have uh, be in select theaters March twenty nine. After that, available on demand April ten. Um, Eric, where's the best place for people to go and find out about screening times, etc.? Is there a website for Long Lost or a Facebook? Page? Yeah. Yeah, we're at facebook.com slash longlostmovie. If you just search Long Lost Movie, it's right there. Uh, and if you want to follow me, I'm at Eric C. Blumquist on Instagram, and I, I post about the movie a fair amount. <laughs> and for everyone out there, I highly recommend the film. I'm going to be working on my review uh, this week and hopefully have it up next week. It's a it's a cool, twisty, uh, psychosexual thriller, a uh, really good twist and turn scene, which I did not see coming. So kudos to you, Eric, because I watch a lot of films, and sometimes you'd see these things coming from a mile away. In this case, it didn't happen for me. So, Eric, I congrat uh, congratulations to you with Long Lost. And uh, hopefully in the future, as you make more stuff, we can talk more about uh, future films uh, that you're you know, to us. Absolutely. I appreciate it, Matt. Thank you.